blood clots are helpful when they form to stop the flow of blood from an injury, but blood clots can also form in harmful ways at unexpected times and in vessels that have not been injured by outside trauma. Even helpful clots that form to stop the flow of blood from an injury may become harmful if they expand in the vessel beyond their beneficial dimensions. In two prior videos, we examined helpful blood clots, how these clots form in response to injury, and how these clots are replaced by scar tissue in the natural healing process. In this video, we'll take a look at harmful blood clots and what naturally happens to them after they've formed. The formation of a blood clot, where the clot may be harmful instead of protective, is called thrombosis, and the clot itself is referred to as a thrombus. When these clots occur in arteries, they may result in conditions like stroke and heart attack, and when they occur in veins, they may produce deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and rare conditions like retinal vein occlusions. In a separate video, we'll consider the circumstances that might cause a harmful clot to form, but right now let's look at what might happen to the clot after it forms. In this illustration, the blood vessel contains red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and clotting factors that float together in the liquid part of blood, the blood plasma. If we add a little more detail to these vessel walls, we see a layer of endothelial cells forming a one-cell thick interior lining for the vessel wall. This lining is called the endothelium. One of the important functions of the endothelium is to prevent blood cells from sticking to the vessel walls. In this example of thrombus formation, the absence of the protective endothelial lining sets the stage for platelet adhesion and activation. Additional platelets and other blood cells are bound together by a meshwork of fibrin strands and a substantial thrombus is formed. So after a potentially harmful clot begins to form, what naturally happens to it? What are the possibilities? There are four main possibilities, dissolution, propagation, embolization, and organization, and we'll go through each one of these. One possibility is that the clot may completely dissolve on its own. The body's natural fibrin severing process, fibrinolysis, may be enough to completely dissolve the clot. But even if the clot is only partially dissolved, blood flow through the vessel may be significantly improved. Another possibility is that the clot may continue to grow or enlarge. This expansion is referred to as propagation. Propagation takes place when the body's natural coagulation inhibitors are overwhelmed by the stimulus for clot formation and the body's natural fibrinolysis response turns out to be inadequate. Over time, a clot may grow completely across the opening of the vessel to block off the flow of blood through the vessel. We'll show a cross-section here over to the right to give a better idea of what's happening. This is called an occlusive thrombus and is more likely to occur in medium and small-sized vessels. In addition to expanding across the opening of the vessel, Clots may also grow lengthwise inside the vessel. In many circumstances, a clot will grow in the direction of the blood flow. In other circumstances, the clot may expand opposite to the direction of blood flow. When a thrombus propagates in an area of fast-moving blood flow, it may contain a greater proportion of lighter colored fibrin and platelets, and a smaller proportion of red blood cells. This gives the thrombus a pale, firm appearance. When a thrombus propagates in circumstances where blood flow is slower, the proportion of red blood cells trapped within the expanding thrombus is much greater, giving the thrombus a deep red color. A third possibility is that a part of or the whole thrombus may break off suddenly and be carried away by the flow of blood. This is said to be an embolization of the thrombus. The portion of the thrombus that is carried away by the flow of blood is called a thromboembolus. If this happens in the left side of the heart or inside of an artery, the embolus travels away from the heart along with the flow of oxygen-rich blood and gets stuck when the size of the embolus exceeds the interior dimension of a progressively narrowing artery. An arterial embolus may become lodged in any number of locations including the arteries supplying blood to the heart, the brain, or the kidneys. If the embolus blocks the supply of oxygen-rich blood to a tissue for a sufficient length of time, 
the tissue located downstream of the blockage may die. If part of the thrombus breaks free inside of a vein, the embolus travels back toward the heart along with the flow of oxygen depleted blood. The embolus travels through the heart along with the oxygen poor blood and exits the heart on its way to the lungs where the blood will absorb fresh oxygen. But the vessels that branch out from the heart into the various areas of the lungs are progressively narrowing and at some point along the way a venous embolus will get stuck in one of these vessels. This results in a condition called pulmonary embolism or more precisely a pulmonary thromboembolism. If the thrombus remains in place without being dissolved the body begins to treat the thrombus as if it were a wound that needed healing. The wound healing process was introduced in a prior video of this series entitled Wound Healing. Similar to what was seen in wound healing, white blood cells within the thrombus, including macrophages, begin to engulf and digest any cells of the thrombus that may die off. Fibroblasts and capillaries, together in a tissue called granulation tissue, slowly invade the thrombus. This migration of cells and capillaries originates from the vessel wall and travels through the point or points where the thrombus is attached to the vessel wall. Parts of the thrombus where the invasion of granulation tissue is well established are said to be organized. Once an area of thrombus is organized, that area will not be susceptible to dissolution by fibrinolysis. But complete organization may take a matter of weeks, and while one part of the thrombus may be organizing, other parts may be dissolving. The cells of the granulation tissue begin the process of degrading the thrombus and replacing it with fibrous scar tissue. If a thrombus only grows large enough to partially block the opening of a vessel, when the clot becomes organized, the resulting scar tissue may eventually shrink and be pulled into or incorporated into the sidewall of the vessel. This allows resumption of greater blood flow through the vessel. If a clot grows to completely block the opening of a vessel, as the clot is organizing, elements of the granulation tissue secrete chemicals which degrade the existing clot, leaving open spaces or pockets within the thrombus. These pockets become lined with endothelial cells and are thought to gradually link up such that small channels are created from one end of the thrombus to the other. The formation of these tiny passageways through the clot is called recanalization. Recanalization may begin as early as a few days after the occlusion of the vessel and over time the initially small channels may expand to accommodate more blood flow. To sum up then, blood clotting is normally a helpful process that can work to preserve the body's supply of blood in the face of injury. But blood clotting apart from injury or as an over-response to an injury can be very harmful. In this video we've looked at some of the aspects of harmful blood clotting with a special emphasis on what can naturally happen to a thrombus after it forms. We've seen that the thrombus may totally dissolve or continue to grow or break off and be carried away by the blood flow, or replaced with scar tissue and eventually be pulled into the vessel wall, or be pierced by tiny channels.